and they went to the sheikh. Yeah, sheikh, can you believe they're selling dogs in the market? We're eating dogs, they're feeding our children dogs. It's like, a'udhu billah, haram. This cannot be, you have to write something to the ministry of this and that. And in the end, it just turned out to be this, you know, beef and lamb and whatever else processed in that way, hot dogs. So it depends on the sheikh himself, you know, if he does not have a background uh, as to the situation that you are living in over here in the West, you're going to get an answer that I would say would not actually um, apply to us over here. Um, and this is very important to understand that uh, a sheikh can only give, and I'll repeat this once more, uh, his fatwa, his verdict, according to the knowledge that he has and the question that's being asked. Now we move on, inshallah, to the first point. I don't want to take too much time right now. The topic is very important. There's quite a few questions I'm sure that you do have. But we'll move on quickly, inshallah, um, to the first slide over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَطَعَمُ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ حِلُّ لَكُمْ This is verse 5 from Surah Al-Marina, where Allah Jalla wa ala says, The food of the people of the book are lawful for you. Now I chose this verse over here in the first slide because of the fact that we're living over here in the West. It's not a Muslim country. Um, we do come across many situations. In this verse, it clarifies a lot to us. So we have two issues here. What is meant by the word ta'am or food? Um, the ulama discussed this in detail in the books of Tafsir, the books of Fiqh. They said, uh, of course, without doubt, food that would include the fruits, vegetables, grains, that's unanimous, without any doubt. It's our halal and lawful to you. Whereas the meats over here, the meat that's in question, if it's slaughtered by a Muslim or one from Ahlul Kitab, then in that case, it's lawful as well. And this is clarified in this verse. So, it's one of the rules that we have in the Sharia. I want to discuss it further, inshallah. Um, of course, these are things that you do get, we get questioned about a lot. This, this as well, can we eat it or not? So here we come to the first segment. Who are Ahlul Kitab? Now, Ahlul Kitab, literally, we can define it as those who receive the divine scripture from Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It refers to Christians and Jews who believe that they receive uh, scriptures, revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet Musa and Prophet Isa. May Allah praise and exalt their mentions. Um, but we have to understand that not everyone living in the West is a Christian. Many of these Shias who come from abroad, they have this notion that everyone living over here in Canada and the States, they do not listen to Christians. Of course, as you know this yourself, this is incorrect. It's, you know, far from the truth to begin with. Besides the fact that, you know, some of them are uh, Buddhists or Hindus, Sikhs, we do have that some of these European uh, Canadians, for example, from European background, they're not, they don't have any religion to begin with. Although they may be pointed out as Christians, but they may be atheists. And I've met quite a few, I'm sure you've met many of them yourselves, taken into the new books of Hawking and whatever else, where they uh, put aside God completely and uh, uh, adopt an atheistic approach on life. And these are not Ahlul Kitab. Once they adopt this type of ideology, this type of faith, you can say even, they are no longer included in the words of Allah, Ahlul Kitab. They would not be included in there. They will be excluded because of their beliefs. Another issue, we do find that some of the Quran, some of those who are, you know, uh, in the field of Dawah, they said, well, Hindus as well, they are Ahlul Kitab. And they use this narration that you can see before you. Sunnu bihim sunnata ahlul kitab. Treat them as you would the people of ahlul kitab. And they say, well, the Bidas is a book that was given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet of the Hindus. Of course, there's no proof for that to begin with. But the hadith itself that's in question, this is a, a, a weak hadith, a weak tradition. So therefore, we cannot use this tradition. And even if we take it, the other part of that tradition states clearly you cannot eat their food. So that's in itself self-explanatory. It does not mean nothing beyond that. Now we're going to go directly into this topic over here, the conditions for that or slaughtering in Islam. We have the first one over here, and this is for Muslims and also you can say uh, Kitabis as well, that the, a person be saying, number two, be a Muslim or Kitabi, and number three, that he mentions Allah's name before the, the actual slaughter. Of course, these are other conditions as well. The relation the tool should be a sharp tool. Um, the animal must be lawful to us, the regular vein, any softness must be cut properly. It must be alive during the slaughtering. It must lose its life only on account of its regular vein being severed. Um, 
you know, this is another issue over here. Is this harsh? Isn't, isn't this harsh? We have people, subhanAllah, that mention, well, this is barbaric, you know, you're torturing the animal. But, you know, I came across, I looked at some research on this, and I came across actually some reports um, where it states that the Islamic method of slaughtering an animal is a lot more merciful to the animal than what happens today. And you'll, you'll be surprised as to what happens today in the slaughterhouse. Maybe some of you don't know exactly what takes place there. But this method, although it may seem barbaric, you know, harsh, whatever else, it isn't. It's actually the most painless way because animal loses its uh, the sense of pain immediately once the, the, the jugular vein and the esophagus are cut. The veins will the, the veins will be cut over there as well. The nerves will be cut, so it would not feel anything afterwards. Slaughtering of the ones. Now, this is something that we should look at as well because it's a, a key fundamental here in this topic: how we can determine something to be halal or haram. So, the first thing we look over here is that the method. Now, this is taken from the USDA websites, Canadian websites as well. Basically, it's a a few step process. The first one, they receive the cattle or the sheep, whatever it is, from the farm or the feedlot. They herd them into holding pens. And these holding pens, they are so, you know, you can say disgusting, the condition that they are pushed into. The animals are forced into certain cells, um, four or five at one, one place, and they defecate, whatever else, and they at times even eat their own defecation out of fear. And they don't have enough food even at times. They're rendered unconscious afterwards hung upside down, and then the artery and jugular vein are severed with the knife and the blood drains. You can see the picture over here, this animal staring back in fear as it's going to be led to its uh, inevitable end over here, to be cut up and to be sent to the market, subhanAllah. Um, the other picture over here, this is completely different from the Islamic style, where it just takes a, a knife and it's basically cut it into the throat. And in complete pain, it has complete pain over here. At times, they don't even die in this stage over here before it's slaughtered properly. Um, the unconsciousness factor over here, that's what's done in one of the steps we said. You know, it's one of four steps, but one of four ways that the unconsciousness is achieved. The first, the chemical, the second, the mechanical, the third, gunshot, and the fourth, the electrical system. Um, we'll talk about the carbon dioxide method, which is asphyxiation, basically. Uh, if an animal dies in this way, according to Islam, it becomes halal for it to consume. And this is quite, getting quite, you know, becoming quite popular in the West, where they take the animal and it's basically uh, put in a chamber, sealed to a chamber. It falls unconscious. It may even die in that state as well because of the, it may even die in a kind of asphyxiation in that, in that sense. Allah Jalla wa Ana prohibits this because He said, "Wa mun khaniqatu." Now that means uh, that Allah has prohibited, prohibited for you the animals that are killed on the of suffocation. The problem is if one animal dies in that way, and then a, a number of other animals don't die in that way, let's say they die, they die in a proper way, and the meat is mixed, you cannot eat that animal or that meat, because you have what is haram and what is halal mixed together, and you cannot consume it. It's something very important to keep in your mind. At times you cannot discern what is and what is not done in a proper Islamic method, especially when it comes to mass production of, uh, of uh, animal, uh, meat, uh, beef, uh, whatever else it may be. They're mixed together, and you can no longer discern what is good and what is not. Um, likewise, the, the animal's meat in that stage may be poisoned. Uh, we have over here, subhanAllah, these, the toxic effect of the gas on the blood and the physiology of the animal, which would actually uh, cause the meat, uh, give it like a, uh, you can say a negative uh, health factor on, on an individual. If you were to consume it, it would be negative to you. It would be, uh, you can say even, a harmful to you in that sense. This method over here as well is the captive bolt. I'm sure that if you've seen that movie, uh, what was it? Uh, um, Old Man, what's it called? With the captive bolt system. There's a movie out that came out in the past. Anyways, I can't recall its name. Where the killer had like a captive bolt system blowing everyone's brain out. It's the same method over here with this, uh, with this with the animal basically. They take this captive bolt system, they put it on top of the head of that animal. The whole key over here is that to last part of the brain that uh, can feel senses. So they put this like a chamber on top of the head of the animal or even a gun and it blasts a circular shaped, uh, you can say a bullet, into the brain. It lodges there and, it, and the brain explodes in the skull of the animal. 